All right, the little wheelie thing stopped turning. That means we're live. I hope we are. Hello, if you're out there, welcome, everybody. Um, let me know if you're out there. Type in the comment section. Tell me where you are. I got things like halfway back to normal here. I got I got the light. Um, I don't know if you can hear the fans. That's another question I have for you. I got uh, Normally, I have no fans because it's so hot and I got no air conditioning. But today, I was able to get uh, one of the batteries uh, charged on the solar, so I got my regular Ryobi fan. And then uh, one of uh, our regular regulars here, Nancy, bought me this, uh, I don't know what you want to call it. It's a little cooling box. It's a USB charged fan that uh, you pour water into it, and it's like a little humidifier, nebulizer. I don't want to show it to you, and I don't want to do a review on it yet because I just got it like two hours ago. I got it charged up. I poured water in. I got it blowing on me. And so after a while, I'll let you know what I think about it. Thank you to Nancy. Uh, we'll see how this works. I'm going to use it tonight, too. It's not really just a humidifier. It's actually got a little, and it has a little beep, which I don't like. I don't know why it has to beep, but it uh, it's like a nebulizer. It actually, uh, the sometimes the moisture comes out in like a mist. I don't know if that's show or what it is. Hello, Scott. Hello, Dana. Uh, hello, everybody. Come on in. Say uh, hi. Let me know where you are. Hit the like button. We've got some things we got to talk about, especially after yesterday. And I know a whole lot of people didn't watch yesterday's uh, episode because it was probably too difficult uh, uh, for, for uh, modern man to get their minds around something uh, like that. So I was going to go a little bit deeper today. Maybe you want to hear this stuff and maybe you don't. Maybe you don't. I'll find out because, like I said, I went. If you go back three, four weeks, uh, three, four shows, I did a show where I just sat here and yelled for uh, forty-five or fifty minutes, and, and 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 the ratings on that one went through the roof. <laughs> Yesterday was a little bit more cerebral. I thought a lot of people would want to hear that stuff, and I did get a couple of nice comments, but I think we only had like eighty people watch the video. But I did get some comments and some private messages, and some people wanted me to go further and explain it a little further, especially the element where I was talking about um, most people live above their capacity. And so uh, one of the things I wanted to start off by saying is that when I say when, when, when other people say most people, and when, when, when you hear most people anytime in commentary or anything like that, the listener waits to hear whether it's good or bad and then if it's bad they exempt themselves because the word most allows them to exempt themselves because it's not everyone you can't say extreme things you can't say everyone is stupid because everyone is not stupid so if you say most people are stupid since it's a negative thing 99.995 of your audience is going to go oh uh, he's talking about those other people <laughs> and so it gives them an out, right? And so when I say most people live above their capacity, I mean almost every single person ever born on the world, in the world, because of the compounding effects of civilization, live above their capacity. Almost certainly. And I have to say, almost, I have to put these qualifiers in there because it's perhaps true that you are an exception, but almost certainly you are not. So that's what we're going to talk about tonight. What I wanted to do, uh, kind of start off doing was just let everybody know, hey, come on in, say hi. Let's talk about things, whatever you want to talk about. Put them in the comments section. I woke up at 6.30 this morning. Uh, normally I'm up at 3.30. Yesterday morning I was up at 2.50. But I slept in because I was tired. I knew I didn't have to get up because today was not a workout day. Today was a rest day. Rest days are critical for muscle building. So this fan just died. The Ryobi just died. That battery didn't get much of a charge on it. So I actually got four minutes into the uh, show. So now I've got this one, the new one. And it's got one of the, you can turn it on and it'll like do this thing. And then you can set it where it actually does like 120 degrees. I've just got it blowing straight on me. We'll see how it goes. I think I got it on full cold and full uh, whatever power. We'll see how it goes. I can feel the breeze. 
And I do believe the breeze is a little bit cooler than it would be. I would have liked to have had this when we had the 108 degrees last week for two days. Because I think it would have maybe been a little bit more noticeable. Right now, it's only about 94 degrees, but it is humid already. So I'm not sure exactly how much a humidifier is going to help. Back in 1993-ish, uh, I don't think my wife's on here. But if she was on here, she could correct me. We lived in a house in Dallas, probably right about in the parking lot of the new Texas Rangers Stadium was where that house was. May still be there. I don't know. But it was right there. I mean, it was within five minutes walk from the uh, ballpark in Arlington, which was built in 94. It opened in 94, but I think we lived there uh, late 93. Hello, Daniel. All that aside, that house, uh, uh, Dallas-Fort Worth is brutally hot in the summer. It, when it's 95 there in 85% humidity and it doesn't cool down at night. I mean, I was complaining yesterday morning because it was 80 in the morning. That was pretty normal. I remember sitting out in the backyard at that house at um, 1145 or 12 o'clock at night and it being 94 degrees. That house had a, uh, uh, what are those called, a swamp cooler, a humid, it, it, it wasn't an air conditioner, it just blew air through water, which is completely useless if you live in a humid, uh, humid environment. So uh, this kind of reminds me of that, but I don't live in a humid environment now, so it, it possibly will work. I'm going to find out. It definitely blows air, which is nice. So... This is supposed to be a conversation. So if you guys uh, had any questions about yesterday's show, if you even watched it, let me know. And uh, and that'll kind of help me know exactly what I need to explain in more detail. But the gist of yesterday's show, and I did not mean it to be depressing, was to show the state of man in 2020 as compared to in previous epochs and how all of this is predictable. And uh, the, the primary foundation behind that was the idea, yes, you're right, Brady, it is very cool in Antarctica. Anyways, um, the whole uh, foundation behind that idea that America somehow has uh, passed some point where the mass man is ever going to be able to be educated into understanding his condition, his position, rather than his uh, natural inclination, which is being amplified by news and media propaganda and all that of um, entitlement and somehow the uh, the concept that where we've codified. Uh, greed and covetousness through time because of the fact that the man today, the mass man, is everywhere because of technology and the, and the, and the effects of civilization being multiplied. Um, the, the mass man can see everything. He can watch billionaires spend their money. He can watch millionaires throw thousands of dollars away in hours on YouTube. He can watch movies he can watch documentaries he can see massive amounts of uh things that he doesn't own and although he is uh in every uh, aspect richer than poor people were even a hundred years ago uh he sees what is uh, available because of the fact that there's this ubiquity of experience and he's covetous I mentioned yesterday that the man who was born on a uh, farm in Russia in the 1600s, his experience, his ability to covet was, was limited by his ability to walk. He could only covet as far as he could walk. He never got up to speed. He never got up to 70 miles an hour on a highway and he was able to see other people's houses and other people's uh, farms and rich, huge cities, uh, uh, automobiles, all those things. 
And so he was a limited, he was limited in that aspect. And because of that, his covetousness was limited. It was only in Russia after the rich began sending their, um, uh, their children to uh, we uh, Western Europe, which was one of the oldest civilizations there was, where you could see massive cathedrals and cities that had been built in the 1200s that were just massive stone, wealthy, gold laid, gold gilded buildings that the Russian uh, uh, and, and being educated in early Marxism went back uh, to Russia. This was in the uh, seven, late 1700s, early 1800s, middle 1800s, and uh, began uh, rebelling, began demanding Demanding all that, the equ uh, equality and outcome. Brady, you're going to have to say something interesting or else I'm going to just boot you. That's just what I do. I, I, I love new people coming on here, but you're going to have to, I have no idea what Zins means. You're going to have to help me out. I live on a farm. I live off grid and I don't have a whole lot of uh, 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 experience in that, whatever you're doing. I don't know what you're saying. All right, but I try to interact with people. So if you're out there and you want to talk and you want to say more than Zins, <laughs> come on in and let's talk. So what I thought I would do today and what the plan is today. All right. See you later, Brady. Big dummy. And by the way, I don't know if you're out there, Hava, but I deleted you. and I blocked you on accident yesterday. I certainly didn't mean to. I meant to block that other idiot and I hit yours. Right as I was clicking it, the whole message thing popped up and I hit yours on accident, but I reinstated you if you're out there. Uh, so does man regress and technology and money increase. You're right. All right. So what I thought I would do today is I would start from the beginning and I would help you understand a lot of what I talk about when I say that man, most people, which means you, live above their capacity. What I want to do is I made the argument yesterday that most people begin when you ask them to comment on something, when they, when they when you ask them to have an opinion on something, they begin in thin air. Their question is, this thing exists or this thing is happening or this thing is in the news. What do you think about it? And you can't really honestly answer in just a few words unless you're willing to go ahead and accept all the presuppositions that support the situation, the argument or whatever it is. But people do it anyway because they don't know any better. So what I thought I would do today is I would start you in thin air. You're going to start in thin air. You are you. You are you with what you know, with your skills, with your intelligence, with your problem solving. You are you. But you're in thin, you're in thin air. You're, you're, you're hovering 50 feet, I don't know, in the air. And we're going to drop you. I thought about dropping you over land, but most people lie to themselves and they actually believe that they have survival skills or that their survival skills they believe they have would actually work. So we're not going to drop you over land because I need to strip you of all of your uh, self-delusions. We're going to drop you over the ocean. This is a uh, lowly populated world and we're going to drop you over the ocean. You live, you survived the drop, but now you're in the ocean. You don't have any tools. You don't have a floaty. You don't have a raft. You don't have a boat. You don't have a paddle. You don't have anything. It's just you in the ocean. What I want you to do is I want you to erase any uh, idea of external salvation, any idea that somebody's going to come along, some ship's going to come along and pull you in. What are your chances? 500 miles from any land with no tools, anything being dropped in the ocean that you're going to live very long. If your answer is higher than 1%, you're a liar or you're stupid. And if your answer is 1%, you're probably just wrong. Your, 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 your answer should be functionally zero. Unless a miracle happens, and unhappily, most of you, because you are logically um, challenged, 
expect a miracle. Unless a miracle happens, you're going to die in the ocean. Why is that? We're going somewhere with this, so just stick with me. The reason why you're going to die is because you're not supposed to live in the ocean. You don't have that capacity. The capacity you have, your ability to form and use tools, your ability to think, your ability to, to utilize resources that are around you is severely limited when you are in the ocean. It is possible. When we talk about statistics, one of the reasons I can't ever say 100% you're going to die is because I try to be accurate. I try to use reason. It is possible that a tsunami or some form of storm or something happened 500 miles away on an uncharted island and it knocked down a whole bunch of big floating bamboo that's going to come floating across the ocean just at the time that you're there. <laughs> Oh, is he back? I'm not seeing him. Hello, everybody. So just at the time you're there, you got dropped out of nowhere. You're just landed in the middle of the ocean. You have zero capacity of surviving out there. And just then, a flotilla of bamboo comes by. <laughs> That's the possibility. I, I, like I said, you have to allow for strange, weird, wild things that could happen. But you didn't do that. Your capacity didn't make that happen. Right? So we're going to go forward from here, and I want you to stick with me and think, and I want you to put yourself in this situation. It just happens, though, for you. It doesn't happen for anybody else. On this very lowly populated planet that you got dropped in the middle of the ocean, and as you are just about to die, you see this flotilla of bamboo coming by and you get to work. You make some thread from your clothing and you get creative with some seaweed floating by and you start tying together bamboo. And when you finally get it to where you can get up on it, you fashion a couple of tools, maybe a knife from bamboo. You start shaving it. You start making some shavings and you get it and you start making rope you're real this is if you are really 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 productive you are really really you have high capacity even though you exist in a environment that you uh, uh is completely contrary to your survival but you start lashing more and more bamboo together you just keep doing it you make yourself some fishing line you catch fish you're able to survive you you build a small rain catchment. You can catch water. You start being able to have water to drink. As things begin to improve, you're working 20 hours a day. You get that raft big enough that it's huge, and you build yourself a house on it. Hey, Ron and Ravonda, good to see you. Now... Things are different. Your human capacity, not because of anything ex ex uh, extremely special about you, but because of the freak chance that you happen to have this flotilla of bamboo go by. Now you've got a place where your capacity will allow you to expand your ability to survive. Every day you continue to work 18 to 20 hours a day, you don't take very many days off and you keep expanding your little island. You make long sections of rope and you actually make yourself a sail and you can move your island. You get closer and closer and closer to a shallower water and finally you get it to where you can dredge some dirt off the bottom of the ocean. You build yourself some raised beds and you got yourself a little garden. Got nothing to plant in it. But you're thinking ahead. Finally get yourself near to some land and you get out there and you go get yourself some seeds and some plants and some pineapple and some whatever. And you go out there and you start to look. You like it on your little island. You haven't found any people. But you keep expanding. At some point, you're just surviving. But you've done some good work. 
You come across some other people, and guess what? They've been dropped in the ocean from 50 feet out of nowhere. They got zero capacity to survive. Zero. You have to think, do I want to pull these people in? What's my relationship going to be with them? Are they entitled to the fruit of my labor? And by entitled, I don't mean out of my charity or my religious charity. I mean, are they entitled? Do they do do by me running across them? Have I encountered a debt? Am I now in debt? Do I owe them? That's the question you have to go through. So you sit back and you go, OK, I'm going to pull these people in. You pull them in one at a time and you give them a little talk. Here's the deal. This is my island. It's not mine because by chance I found a whole bunch of stuff. It's mine because I've invested of the hours and minutes of my life, 18 to 20 hours a day for a year or two or three or four or however long it's been. And that investment entitles me to ownership of this island. You don't have to agree. <laughs> if you don't agree, get off of it. All kinds of things now come into play. Am I capable of defending it? Do I have a right that they didn't have or that I didn't have when I was just floating in the ocean? Do they have a lien on my productive capability? All of these things have to be worked out. And you know what? That's what happened in real life. These things have to be worked out. Sometimes they're worked out peacefully and sometimes they're worked out violently. But the people who invested the most time and effort who eventually developed the means to protect ownership rights of the time, the, the hours and the minutes of the seconds of their lives, come to the position where they're capable or they're able to make certain demands. In other words, they are not indebted merely because they exist. Their hard work did not put them in debt. Now, you're the first person. You're person number one. You built the whole island and you got this whole thing going and you got it productive and you created it and all of that. And still, you know that you owe. You owe. Your debt is not to the other people that you pull out of the water. But you have a debt because you would have never made it if certain circumstance hadn't happened. And that circumstance was that something already existed. Creation already existed. And on that creation, there were resources. Those resources were there for you when you needed them. So you should have in you, as a natural man or woman, gratefulness. Now you can determine to whom or to what you should be grateful. Some of you and a lot of you might be grateful, but you're grateful to an inanimate thing. Or you create life in something that is inanimate. You decide to worship the, cre the creature. That's up to you. But you have a debt. And that knowledge of the fact that there was labor, there was work that was uh, performed before you were there that allowed you to survive, that created that gratefulness, also creates in you uh, the knowledge that those to whom you bestow graciousness to also incur a debt. And, and this de developed into what we're calling property ownership. So long as people live loosely on the land, which means they grab things as they ran by or they ran after them, they really never developed a concept of land ownership. But when they became advanced in their capacity of understanding the natural world and how the natural world manifests, and they were able to take advantage of tools and take advantage of natural materials to build and to work and to transfer the hours and the minutes of the seconds of their lives into tangible property. The concept of property ownership became ingrained and intrinsic in all humans, and it exists from and before birth. 
If you don't think so, you've never had children. When a newborn child or one-year-old is sitting there playing with a toy and somebody comes by and tries to take it from them, they are righteously indignant because they have a concept of ownership, even if it's wrong, even if it's not even their toy, even if it's somebody else's toy. But the concept of ownership is, ownership is a human concept. It becomes uh, activated when we bestow labor, when we invest labor in things and places. Hand in hand with the idea that there's value that's created from the earth. And that's something I wanted to, you heard me talk about it before. I've talked about it several times, but I want to go back through it because it's apropos right here. Most of the wealth that have ever existed in the world, all real wealth comes from the ground. And I'm not talking about gold and silver. They come from the ground. They are a uh, measure of wealth. But real wealth <clears throat> comes from the ground in a um, repetitive way. In other words, it's constantly coming from the ground. Most of the wealth that exists in the entire world came up from the ground in the uh, form of grass. Yeah, your grandchildren are human. <laughs> that's the way that's the way that humans are, man. If they see it, it belongs to them. So most real wealth, almost all of it that exists in the world came up from the ground in the form of grass and other natural resources, trees, etc. Things were made from those, animals were fattened on those, they became money. Those things were exchanged for other value. And as and only because of the repeated nature of grass and natural materials continuing in a uh, biosphere kind of way, a sustainable way coming from the ground, wealth multiplied as labor was applied to natural resources. It is wrong, and this will help you when you look out into what's going on in politics today. It is an absolute error to believe that because there are natural resources, there is wealth. Some of the areas of the world today that have the most natural resources are the poorest areas in the world. Because natural resources have, have to be combined with uh, productive capacity in order to create wealth. The natural resources of the bamboo had to be combined with your productive capacity to create, create your island nation. Grass coming from the ground in and of itself produces no wealth. That's right. And Abram's flock grew. You know exactly where I'm going. When a productive, creative mind, thank you, Vordogheim, for that. This is the way we survive. When a productive, creative mind is able to apply itself to the natural resources that are under its control and to do so sustainably, wisely, as a wise steward, as Abram was, and they could put creatures on there and then they could take care of those creatures and treat them benevolently and they can use them and use those resources and expand them and multiply them. Uh, uh, eventually, what you have, which is where we started yesterday, is you have the developing of nations and the developing of cities and the seeds of that destruction which are to come, which we are experiencing now. Now, you started on your island nation with your bamboo and your uh, 20 hours work, and now you've got other people that are there. Other people are looking at it. They don't understand particularly why you're in charge. Why are you in charge? They should be dead. They would be dead. They should be grateful, but eventually they aren't. Perhaps you grow old on your island nation and you die and you hand it all off to your child because the idea of generational wealth is also a human and uh, a very uh, uh, natural concept. 
the idea that you built anything at all and that you didn't stop when you had yourself a good 20 by 20 uh, raft with a hammock on it was because that you knew at some point or you thought at some point or genetically and um, subconsciously you knew that it was a possibility you were going to procreate and you were going to create offspring and that your desire was to provide and to maintain and expand the species. There is no maintaining, expanding the species if we do not have a concept of generational wealth. That's why the people that are rioting and the people that are protesting are against generational wealth, they're against property ownership, and they're against uh, anybody uh, insisting on uh, the, the value that they've invested in things actually belongs to them. You see where we're going. So on your island nation, you leave everything to your son and then you perish and you get a watery grave delayed. Now your son's in charge and perhaps he doesn't have the capacity that you do. Perhaps. Maybe he does and maybe his grand, you know, your grandson doesn't or your great grandson. At some point down the line, that capacity doesn't exist. And the people that are out there who have um, watched through the years, say that person doesn't have any natural value. All they do is they trade on the work and the labor of others. They have no nat they add nothing to the economy of this place, and therefore they overthrow you, and they put in your place even uh, those with even less capacity, and you have a deg degradation of society. They tear down your house and they tear down the monuments and they tear down everything and the history. And they stop teaching how this uh, island fortress even came to exist. They stop teaching it and they come up with alternative theories and alternative stories. And people who never have produced anything in their whole life begin to decide that the best way to do all of this and to make us all equal is we're going to burn this effing raft rap to the ground and we're going to start out with everybody being equal. So out in the middle of the ocean, 500 miles from land, they take a, a blowtorch to it and they burn the raft down and everybody's in the water again, left alone with their own capacity to survive in an environment that is not uh, 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 beneficial for their survival. You see where we're going? It doesn't matter whether you think historical personages were evil or they did evil things or does it matter whether you think that certain uh, practices in uh, modern light were uh, beneficial or not wealth in and, of, in and of itself is not does not exist merely because there are natural resources this is also this whole argument that i'm making is also why the idea of going and terraforming another planet and somehow we're going to create natural resources on another planet that is hostile to our survival. Somehow we're going to be able to go there and we're going to make that work. It's never going to happen because of human nature. It's never going to happen. The idea that you can terraform a place that's hostile to human survival, to do so you would have to add resources from a place that is not hostile to human survival. In other words, before that, something had to exist before that. It's the teleological argument. What existed before this terraforming? Well, we had to bring resources from Earth, whether it's a neutron bomb or whatever it is we're going to do to uh, terraform this planet. They always, they're, they're always sitting back there and they're like, look, if we can find a planet out there that has water, we can make everything. That's bullshit. <laughs> the same people are telling us this world is broken and it's full of water. They can't fix it. But you have to bring resources from another place. When I had you up in the midair and I was about to drop you over the ocean, I could have dropped you over the earth where there was a lot more natural resources over land. And let's just say you weren't injured. Let's say you survive. You still would have to survive in that environment based on your current capacity. 
you still would have to expand and grow and survive or else your progeny, your whole genetic line would be over with. Somebody had to do that. Somebody started this whole thing. Somebody actually created the raft you're on. When you were the first one, if you were the first one pulled out of the water onto that raft, you would have been thankful. If you were the second or the third or the fourth or the 20th person pulled out of the water onto the raft, you would have been thankful. Why? Because you were dead. You were absolutely dead. But thankfulness has been erased from modern man, from the mass man. He walks out of his house and he sees uh, wonderments that he can't even describe. Jet planes flying overhead. He can walk walk past vehicles that he couldn't even begin to understand in a million years. You can see technology, the nebulizing of water being blown and charged by USB and all of this uh, technology, not have a clue how any of it works. Sees an apple tree produce apples when it could produce rocks or it could produce anything else, but it produces apples. A man should be grateful that an apple tree produces apples. He should be grateful that when he walks around, he sees these wonderments and these things and that he's able to benefit from them. This is an economic lesson. When I say that you live above your capacity, I'm saying that there is a foundation of civilization, whether you think it's evil or, or good, doesn't matter. But because it exists, you are able to live better and happier to embrace your family, to live in some system of comfort because it exists. And there are people out there that want to take a blowtorch to it. They want to burn it. They want to burn the raft down and let everybody start again. Or they think that they, because they started in midair, are somehow going to be able to do what it took thousands and thousands and thousands of years of people smarter than they are to develop. And they are willing to break a few eggs. They are willing to do evil things. They're willing to commit murders and robberies and tortures and rapes and whatever it takes because they believe that their ability, their capacity to create a society and a civilization, a raft nation that's better for everybody is better than the one that they're on now that took thousands of years to develop. There is injustice. There are things that are wrong, but you can talk about those on the raft. You can possibly improve them on the raft. But once you burn it down, the time for talking is over. The time for improvement is over. What you've had uh, delivered to you is a spiritual economic lesson about gratefulness and about what it is to be human and why we ought to be able to look out into the world and whether we agree with it, whether or not we think it lines up with our religious affections or whether or not whatever it is, we ought to have a sense of gratefulness, and there is no gratefulness that exists in a vacuum. Gratefulness is always directed somewhere. That's the question. For me and for my house, our gratefulness is the Lord creator that created the big raft. We didn't just fall into the middle of the ocean with the sharks. He put us on a raft. He put us on the only planet we know of on which we could survive with every natural resource, most of them renewable, most of them sustainable, so that entire thousand year generations and empires could rise and fall and we could all live and we could try to work this thing out. Hello, Chuck. So that's the thing. That's the thing that is the thing. You ought to be grateful. You ought to be grateful to the creator of the raft, of the world that exists. Stop trying to burn it down because you think you can do it better. 
If there's a way to fix things that are wrong, then we do that through a thing called education and law. All right. Anybody's out there that got any questions or comments or anything you want to talk about? That's my speech for today. Perhaps you found it helpful. If you did, I would appreciate a like. I have no idea what YouTube is saying, but I'm only seeing three likes. Burn it down. Oh, my gosh. There he is. I'm only seeing three likes. It could be more. I don't know. I've been a little bit dejected. I think we got four or five comments yesterday on the YouTube. Very few people watched it. I hope you guys are going to share. I hope you're going to like it. I appreciate the uh, the uh, super chat. Appreciate you guys going down in the comments and in the description. If you're one of the future people, go down in the description and you can find out how you can find my website, michaelbunker.com. I'm here almost every night, 7 p.m. Hey, you guys, I got a plan. I'm going to have my first guest. Let me tell you why I have in the past not had guests ever. I don't have guests. Uh, okay, well, good. Those likes aren't showing up on mine yet. I don't have guests. Let me tell you why. Because I don't find, I find people interesting and I can have conversations with people and I can talk with them. But I don't tremendously uh, find them that engaging in interview situations. Not very often do I hear an interview with somebody where I'm like, well, that was the best information I could get from that person. Because usually either the host is trying to do too much. or It just doesn't work out. I've been on a bunch of interviews. I've been interviewed thousands of times, and some of them have been very, very good. But I just always felt like if I'm going to be the interviewer, then the whole show needs to be improved by it and not. Would it be better for me to do 45 minutes like I just did or me to sit here and talk to somebody? I got light coming in this window and hit me right here. So I am going to have a guest and I have a guest plan and that guest is going to be Garrett Bradford. And I'm working with Garrett to try to figure out when it may be tomorrow night or maybe the next night. I'll let you know. You'll have about 24 hours to know. And I want everybody to be here. Yes, Wardogheim, you are a model citizen of the Bunker Nation. I appreciate it. So Garrett Bradford is a, a country singer, young man who is very, very talented. For some reason, I got into the uh, world of some country people, Texas country, and I've made some friends. And uh, Kayla Ray is one of them. Garrett's another one. And uh, man, I'm trying to get that light off my face. It's irritating. But uh, and, and I really like Garrett's music. Uh, look up Garrett Bradford. I'll put some links in all this, but uh, he's going to be on the show. I'm going to talk to him. He just got he just found out that he's going to be uh, a song that's been unreleased of his is going to be on Yellowstone. And I just started watching Yellowstone uh, just recently. I've caught up, but my son uh, messaged me and said, you got to watch oh, this light. You got to watch Yellowstone, Dad. So I watched it and I really liked it. And uh, and not long after I got caught up, I heard from Garrett and he said, hey, I'm going to have a song on Yellowstone. So uh, I'm really excited about that. In fact, right as soon as I finish here, I'm probably going to watch last night or the night before is Yellowstone. So that's what's uh, going on. So y'all, when, when I ever, whenever I announce that Garrett's going to be on here, I expect everybody, I want full attendance. I want you to bring 10 people with you. I want a full audience. He's going to play some songs. And all this kind of stuff, and it's going to be cool, and I'm really looking forward to it. It's part of my whole indie series where I'm going to be talking with indie anybody. If you are an indie musician, indie author, indie uh, movie maker, indie race car driver, not indie, at Indianapolis, but whatever, I want to talk to people, and every once in a while I'm going to uh, 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 have them on the show and I'm going to interview. All right, y'all. I appreciate you guys. I hope you learned something today. Please go to YouTube after this is over. Daniel, and leave a comment in the next five or 10 minutes. Some of you, I'm not going to mention any names, Scott Glenn, don't seem to be subscribed. Maybe you are, and I'm wrong, but it doesn't seem like you're subscribed. It seems like you watch the shows all the time, which I appreciate. But we need to be subscribed. Only 50% of the people that watch my shows are subscribed. I don't understand why. Subscribe. Leave a comment. Like. All that kind of stuff. Go down in the description, read all that stuff. I appreciate you guys. God bless you. I love you. Lord willing, I'll see you again tomorrow or maybe the next day.